Welcome, everybody. Uh, well, you're here at the Bloomberg Green Summit, but uh, over the previous two days, we had our uh, research on Bloomberg NEF have a summit in New York, and they had an award uh, given out to uh, startups called the Pioneer Awards. And they are awards given to early stage startups that are doing pioneering work. Um, which they've given across many different sectors. When they started off uh, a few years ago, it was around solar and wind and batteries. And as climate tech has progressed and is going towards harder to abate sectors, uh, they've started giving out awards for food and for metals and for hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So we have two of the award winners uh, with us on stage today, and they are focused on hydrogen. Now, we'll come to the hydrogen market, but let's just start with an elevator pitch for what your companies do, and maybe we start with you, Tulika. Thanks, Akshat. Great to be here. Um, I'm Tulika, CEO and co-founder of SunGreen H2. SunGreen H2 is supercharging all commercial electrolyzers using nanotechnology. Uh, and what that really means is uh, we use nanotechnology and nanostructured components inside electrolyzers to double the output of hydrogen from a single machine while using 10% lower energy consumption and reducing the use and reliance on precious metals by 30 times. So we're here to make green hydrogen affordable for and, all electrolyzers. And energy efficiency is very important because uh, if you look at estimates of where hydrogen consumption uh, is headed, if we are on a track to reach net zero, according to Bloomberg NEF estimates, in 2050, a third of all electricity produced which will be more, a lot more than the total electricity produced today, will be for hydrogen production. So you need to make that process a lot more efficient. Mm. Do you want to go with your mm. elevator pitch? Now? Yes, so I'm, I'm Ignacio Vincas. I'm with H2 Pro, head of North America. Honored to be representing the company here. Very happy that we won the award. Uh, and uh, yeah, what makes us different is we've been producing hydrogen uh, uh, in, in addition to the normal now uh, natural gas uh, uh, sourced hydrogen with electrolysis for over 100 years. But that technology is old. It has uh, 60 to 70 percent energy efficiency and uh, gradually it's been improving, but we brought a step change, so we're 95 percent efficient. We do it a bit different with a, a thermochemical reaction in, in a two-step process. And uh, so this allows us to produce more hydrogen with less electricity and also uh, bring down the cost, not just the operating cost, but the capital, because the, uh, the, the rest of the energy is normally going to waste heat, for which you need more equipment to remove that heat from the system. So, so you get double the benefit. You're not just yes. reducing the total amount of energy mm -hmm. needed, right. uh, but you also have to deal with less of the waste heat. So right. you have to reduce the amount of components you're putting into the system. Less equipment. And also the, the chemistry we use allows us to not use the typical platinum, iridium, expensive metals that are used in the anode in normal electrolysis. Now, we talked about how by 2050 there's going to be a lot of hydrogen that will be needed if we are on the path to net zero. But you guys are going to scale up now. Mm -hmm. So uh, H2Pro was founded in 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, Sungreen H2 was founded in 2020. You're re, you know, new companies, relatively speaking. So you are entering the market now. What is the market opportunity for both of you? Because you're making components for uh, the hydrogen uh, electrolyzer, and you're making the entire electrolyzer. So right. just talk us through the market opportunity right now. So the, right now, the, the market of uh, hydrogen is about uh, 100 million tons per year production. 100 million tons uh, of uh, actual hydrogen. Actual hydrogen produced. And most of it is used for what? So the, the, most of it is used in, in oil refining and ammonia production. Okay. And so you're so, going to attack that market. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, that if you're going to make green hydrogen, you're going to require electrolyzers that will split water. Uh, right. And one of the estimates suggests something like $130 billion worth of electrolyzers right. will be sold this decade in the, in the remaining seven years. So that's the size market you're going for. Right. How about, Oh, sorry. So there, and there is actually more, right? Because that's the existing hydrogen for those applications, but hydrogen will be used to decarbonize other industries like right. green steel. So that's additional hydrogen on top of that. Right. So today you're using it for refineries and for ammonia production. Right. Then if you go down the green steel route, then you'll re need hydrogen for more right. purposes. You know, I would like to say that while there's a 100 million ton hydrogen market today and all this hydrogen is being used for ammonia, methanol production, We've got to think about what low-cost renewables 
and affordable green hydrogen are going to make possible going forward, even out to 2030, from 2025 to 2030 and beyond, you will find newer applications for green hydrogen, not least in transportation, mm -hmm. long duration energy storage, decarbonizing our power generation sector, and all of that is simply going to expand. And what I see, the IEA, for example, projects that the hydrogen market is going to go five-fold to 2050, 500 million tons. Mm -hmm. And I see that green hydrogen, the low carbon form of producing hydrogen without any carbon dioxide emissions, can take a significant share of that, displacing almost entirely, mm -hmm. over a long period of time, the fossil fuel-based hydrogen production market. And what's going to be driving that is technologies like electrolyzers, components like ours. So we see in the immediate future a billion dollar addressable market opportunity uh, just because we supply electrodes. We also supply certain types of stacks and that just increases the market opportunity further. Um, but the underlying market pie is growing even larger. So I think all of us have to be really focused on that expansion of the pie um, versus you know what the slice of the pie is right now. But the hype around hydrogen is not a new one. Um, uh, there's an investor who spoke again at the Bloomberg NEF summit who said, uh, you know, that she invest. She had a ton of deals come to her uh, desk in uh, in the past decade, but she didn't invest in any of them. Invested in Tesla instead, and yeah. is now a successful investor because of that. Uh, why do you think this time around, when again a lot of hydrogen companies are coming out, that this time investors are making the right bet by giving you money? If I may. Uh, address this. 15 years ago, we didn't have cheap renewables. One of the fundamental things that you need to make green hydrogen is green electrons from renewable electricity and the machines themselves, electrolyzers and the components that we make. It's only now, over the last 10 to 15 years, that we have seen a significant cost uh, reduction in renewables. So cheap renewables are finally available and the cheapest new form of generation in over 90% of the world's electricity markets currently is new wind and solar. So it's because we have low cost affordable renewables that low cost affordable derivatives like green molecules, like green hydrogen are finally becoming possible. And this is primarily what is different about the hydrogen market this time around versus 10 to 15 years ago is what I would say. Would you like to yes. add anything? Yes, yeah, so we, we have, uh, like Tulika said, lower cost of green power. We have lower cost electrolyzers. We continue to improve. So now we're getting to the point where it's, it can be competitive. And when you add things like the incentives in the IRA, uh, then all of a sudden it will be cheaper eventually to do green hydrogen. I mean, the H2Pro is working on enabling a dollar per kilogram of hydrogen by the end of this decade with the lower capex and opex we bring to these systems. Uh, and that is before the IRA, so. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's interesting, the three people here are, you know, you live in Singapore, your company is Singapore-based, your company is based in Israel, even though you live here. Right. I live in London, but we are all talking about the Inflation Reduction Act, and especially on hydrogen, uh, the kinds of incentives, and these are incentives that are coming in the form of actual money given for production of hydrogen, mm -hmm. are, the most attractive around the world. And so a lot of you are now looking to the US uh, for trying to figure out where uh, you can build or you can sell your product. When you come in, what are the difficulties now that you do have this government incentive available? What are the difficulties you have to overcome to enter a crowded space? So they're, they're, like you said, there's a lot of incumbents already on electrolysis, right? <clears throat> so uh, we're an Israeli company. We saw the IRA uh, and the, the market uh, focus shifted maybe more from Europe to the US now, right? So now I'm here uh, to, to get the business for each pro started in, in the US. And, um, and you were hired right after the Inflation Reduction Act. Right, yes. Well, so that's when they decided they started the search and I'm, I'm here now, and, uh, uh, which is great. Um, and... Uh, so then, but so what, what's the challenge? So we have a new technology, it's very different, right? When you say 95% efficiency, it gets people attention, but it gets them, can I go see one? Well, we can go see a prototype in Israel. Right. It's not as convenient as having one here. So, so working through the, the market, educating them as to how the technology works so they can take a look under the hood and understand what, what it is that we're doing, it's, it, that's a challenge. That's the that challenge. Yeah. 
How about you? Akshat, if I may say so, you know, you talk about the market being uh, competitive, but let's take a step back and look at what the market is. The entire global sales of electrolyzers last year were one gigawatt. The demand for electrolyzers out to 2030 is 100 gigawatts. This is a massive increase uh, in demand, and I think supply has to catch up. If you look at the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, there is a lot of focus on electrolyzer manufacturing, but predominantly, um, there's buckets there that are of a lot of appeal to companies like ourselves um, because they, fo they focus on localizing the supply chain, building domestic manufacturing capabilities um, in advanced electrolyzer components. And I think, you know, there's, there's a role that regulation has to play and there's a role that technology has to play. The role of regulation is to enable the market to develop. And the role that technologies like ours are doing is to bring down that cost differential between the incumbent fossil fuel-based hydrogen production faster by using technology that can double output, increase efficiency, uh, reduce the reliance on precious metals. And all of this, both policy drivers as well as technology enablement, is going towards making affordable green hydrogen because it's only when you're able to compete at cost um, with fossil fuel-based resource that you can go for wide-scale adoption and decarbonization of hard-to-abate sectors like green steel, ammonia, right. so on and, and so the, forth. The credit that the uh, Inflation Reduction Act is providing is going toward trying to make green hydrogen, which is more expensive than making it from natural gas today, cheap enough so that it can compete. But again, you started these companies before Joe Biden was elected or the Inflation Reduction Act was ever thought of. So you clearly had a base case to make within the countries that the companies were created in. So talk me through what is it the market that you were looking at when you first created the company and why was it the best place to create it in Singapore or, or in Israel? Sungreen H2 was formed just over two years ago. Um, and what we were seeing at the time, uh, while we're Singapore and Melbourne based, we have a production in Melbourne and we're headquartered in Singapore. What we were really seeing is um, the European Union, which has been traditionally a leader in adoption of clean uh, energy, uh, and where the financing for these types of clean energy and renewables has typically been at a more higher ratio, let's say, than other nations, uh, including in the United States, we were seeing fast developments in the hydrogen sector. Uh, even before the Ukraine crisis, which is unfortunate to the extreme, we were seeing that the European governments were having a, a really focused approach towards energy independence and securing supply from non-traditional fuel sources. The last time we saw the European governments really get behind any kind of policy incentive, this was 15 years ago when we had the generous speed and tariffs for wind and solar. As a result, we today have massive supply chains, manufacturing of solar panels and wind turbines. And because of this large volume of production, we've seen the cost come down drastically in the wind and solar business. So our hypothesis, based on what we were seeing happen in Europe and increasingly we're Asia-Pacific based in Japan, South Korea, um, is the hydrogen economy finally start to emerge. And this is what led us to form the company to try and address the need for um, improving the output of electrolyzers as the industry scaled up. But the, the real cost declines that we saw in solar came through Chinese manufacturing. Uh, you're based in Singapore and you're manufacturing in Australia. They're not typically the cheap places to, to get either labor or manufacturing costs. So wh why, why in those two places? You know, that's a great question. We need to think about why the cost of anything comes down. Actually, for every doubling of manufacturing output, you know, there is a certain learning curve that you come down. Now, you can go to uh, countries where the labor cost input is so low that cheap manufacturing can happen in that way. However, most of the manufacturing processes involved in the stack assembly, the building out of components, as well as assembling of electrolyzer systems, I would argue, are highly automatable. So in other words, we can make technology work for us. And I think it's increasingly the view with a lot of the regulation and the carbon border adjustment mechanisms that we see in various forms, carbon taxation. I think the view this time around is that you know we shouldn't let um, all manufacturing go pool into uh, geopolitically, we shouldn't let all manufacturing pool into one particular region of the world, rather decentralized manufacturing, localizing supply chains and being able to be resilient and robust about creating jobs uh, in the immediate markets that are using the technologies of predominant interest. And I think that is really what is driving I would say clean tech 2.0, that's why it's going to be different this time the way manufacturing is done. What about Israel and hydrogen? So, um, what do 
to the first part of the question, so we saw that there's no decarbonization, no net zero without hydrogen, right? So, and uh, yeah, we had an issue in the Technical University, this research that started in 2012, that had this step change in uh, hydrogen production. And um, so now, yes, we were starting manufacturing there, but the, the way we bring out costs, like Tulika was saying, is it's, it's not like looking for uh, lower cost labor, but it's rather uh, using different materials, automating. Uh, so our first factory is already leased uh, and it's in Israel. And we are looking where we put our second factory to start producing in 2027. Now, we are also talking at a time where venture capital funding, largely, not climate tech alone, has declined. This is tied to macroeconomic factors, a recession may be coming. Um, have you seen that in your own trying to raise money situation where you go to uh, investors and you're trying to pitch and they, you know, you're not getting as high a valuation as you had thought or you're not getting as much cash as you want to be able to do what you want, what you want to do? I'm going to go first. Uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm not the one working on that, but I can tell you we, we've raised through Series A and B uh, over 100 million. So uh, in, in that sense, we're comfortable. However, there's discussion ab about uh, round C coming up. Um, I can't comment as to whether we were finding roadblocks or not. Right. Yeah, likewise, I'd say that you know, we're a younger company and we've just closed a seed round of funding. We're going into a Series A and we would argue that depending on the sector that you're in, you know, the VC climate can be unimpacted we're seeing a strong amount of interest from, you know, thematic investors who have strong views on energy tech, climate tech, hydrogen tech, if you may. Um, and, you know, it really depends on what part of the business you're in. Uh, certainly, I think we're bucking the trend with this. And uh, at least you did come from uh, the oil and gas industry. And we just had a panel discussion talking about people who are quitting oil and gas to work on climate change. What was your journey like making this transition? Um, so when I was a young engineer, I'm an electrical engineer by training, I found myself on the offshore oil and gas rigs in Kazakhstan and Norway. And um, even as a very young engineer, it was a very natural pivot for me back in the day 15 years ago when uh, BP started working on wind and solar. It was a very natural pivot for me to say, hey, as a young person, I can really see the future, you know, in a renewable resource and wind and solar. So it was a very easy decision in a way. 15 years ago was probably unsexy at the time and maybe a few people thought I was a bit crazy. Um, however, it's just never, but once, you know, it's like seeing the light, once you've seen the light, you know, in terms of a sustainable, you know, circular, uh, natural way of living and harnessing natural resources uh, that are renewable, I don't think there's ever, ever any, any going back. So it was kind of natural in that sense. And anything from your past in, in working in different sectors that informs your work now? So, well, I've, I started my career uh, mostly in refining, petrochemicals, uh, even ammonia throughout the years. So I've been around hydrogen, gray hydrogen, for a long time. But on my last job before this one, we had a lot of focus on sustainability, a lot of uh, focus on, on the growth of uh, low carbon hydrogen. So I made the decision I wanted to pivot to 100% of my work being devoted to that. Uh, ideally with a startup, so that's how we ended up with H2Pro. Wonderful. Well, uh, I hope you enjoy the conversation with these two startups. Uh, you can hear a lot more about climate tech and both investing but also startups on uh, a podcast that I host for Bloomberg Green called Zero. Uh, if you are into podcasts, I would hope you would subscribe. Uh, but for now, please thank uh, Talika and Ignacia. Thank you. Thank you.